Okay, this is one, this is one look, uh, one stock scene. My name is Marvin Capro. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about my knowledge around powwow, uh, baska. Um, first of all, I'd like to speak about the books and uh, and our association to powwow, you know, to what it is today. Um, the first uh, form of, I guess, social dancing, social dancing in this area uh, with the Blackfoot people, but I, I can only speak about the Bloods because I'm, I'm Blood Ghana, um, is the first form of social dancing is uh, back in the days, and this is, goes back, way back into the, uh, into the dog days, before the horse, before contact. They say that uh, they were all women dancers, Akipaska, uh, and they would be because uh, mainly the other dances that were they were war dances. They were all basically war dances, and they weren't really social. They dance when when uh, you know they're going to go to battle, or ceremonial dances and stuff. That's mainly the, the dances that were around. But the social dances were the women dances, and those. Uh, would be the round dance, rabbit dance, owl dance, those those type of dances, and when the and it would be women's choice, they would pick out the men to come and dance with them, and they were kind of courting dances. Um, the round dance, uh, um, I I can't speak too much on on its origin because I really don't know, but I know it's one of the oldest form of women dances and stuff. It's been around for years and years. Uh, with the round dance, the round dance, I guess um, the men would sing for the women and they would make love songs. They would make love songs and would make, uh, you know, to, to, to impress the women with their singing and women would get up and dance for them and stuff. And uh, that's as, I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. The rabbit dance uh, they say that there was two rabbits, they were playing in the snow, playing in the snow and stuff, a female and a male. And the way their footprints were, they would circle each other. And the way their footprints were uh, in the snow is how this dance was created. And so the rabbit dance, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a male and, and female, and the female chooses her partner. And, uh, and they do this dance and they constantly circle each other. Um, Obviously, I don't have a partner, so I can't, I can't, uh, I can't show a, a demonstration. Demonstration, and then there's the uh, owl dance. Owl dance is also a court dance. In the old days, they used to call it uh, a blank dance, and uh, a man, a woman would choose a man, and they would, uh, they would dance. They would dance uh, the owl dance and stuff. And if you know if they continue to choose the same partner, uh, one of the parents would throw a blanket over them or a robe covering them while they're dancing, and they would go up and pull it off. And, and if they're like kissing or you know being very close and intimate, then they would start arrangements in, in, in marriage, possible marriage and stuff. So those were those kind of dances, but they were courting dances, and and like I said, it was women's choice. For these, so in, in saying that, you know, just going back to some of the cultural stuff, there was arranged marriages, but uh, women had a lot of to do with uh, with some of the choices and who they married and stuff. And, you know, uh, okay, so those were some of the the women dances. But going back to the bloods, our first like social dances, they say at one time at Akogat, our sun dance large encampment um, the holy woman was putting up a, was going to have a oh god and she turned around and she uh, went to all the, the the young men adolescents preteens and she went to all the young men and she says well why don't you guys go out and you know figure out something some sort of celebration something that doesn't have to do with spirituality doesn't have to do with not the walk spirituality, holy things, something where we can celebrate, something where we can, 
you know, show off our accomplishments, show off our, our deeds, you know, and stuff, but in a social way, not in praise, not in, you know, not in, in uh, you know, praise associated to ceremony, but just basically showing off. And even the word busca, you know, it, it basically means like show off, show off dance or to express yourself, but in, in that manner with pride and, and, you know, even to be a little modest or even outright conceited and stuff, just to, you know, to, to let loose. And so she asked all the young men, go out, you know, figure out something. So they all went out and they all started coming back and they all decided, well, a dance, let's figure out a dance. So they went out and some would go out and they watch the deers and stuff. And, you know, come back with different dances and they'd go in and show the whole holy woman these dances, deer dance, and, uh, white tail dance, uh, antelope dance, all different types of dances and she was like, no, it just, it just wasn't serious. There was one young guy, he comes and he goes out early in the morning and there was some grouse, there was some grouse, they were out uh, doing their mating dances their mating ritual. And he watched it. And there's all the uh, all the males. All the males they were dancing. And all the females were you know, standing around watching. Watching all the hens were watching. And uh, and boy they, they these uh, males would really they compete against each other. They compete against each other and stuff and dance and trying to uh, impress the females because if they impress the females they're the ones that are going to fertilize the eggs and stuff and, and he watched and he watched and he was so so blown away how these males were so proud with their chests out and you know their 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 necks their their necks would all heckle up and, and you know they pop out and everything and you know they almost look like they're going to fight but they don't touch each other all they do is dance and compete compete and you know and the the the, the male another male would come and they compete and you know whoever wins another one would come and you know and right to the end and so he went back to the holy woman went back to her lodge and she was fasting and she was doing her her her, her ceremony for the sun lodge and he comes in he says okay I've got to dance and he starts dancing and oh he's got his chest out and he's kind of flirting with the old ladies in there and even with the holy woman he's flirting and he's like you know keeping his eye on her and smiling and just moving his body and, you know and stuff and really really showing off eh? and they got done and you know he kind of got in trouble got into a little bit of trouble even some of the men there they gave him gave him a little bit of heck because he was showing off and it's supposed to be a real humble ceremony and she's supposed to be you know, the holy woman has this uh, certain standard she's supposed to follow. She's supposed to be, you know, virtuous and, you know, you know all of these uh, different things that go with being a holy woman. And, uh, and you know, the old ladies were covering their mouths and they were so shocked with this young guy. Finally, the, old, the holy woman said, well, she asked him, well, why did you uh, choose this dance? You know, where did you get it? And he says, well, I was watching these prairie chickens. Dito geeks, I was watching them, and this is the way they dance. And, and I figured, well, you know, he wanted something without ceremony. Well, this way we can, you know, show off all our accomplishments. We can be proud and we can, you know, we, you know, because throughout Sundance, we have to be humble. We have to, you know, we have to watch our pride. We have to, you know, we have to keep ourselves, you know, really grounded. And now everything's over, we can show off. We can show off what we've done. We can show off, you know, the importance of, of these ceremonies and celebrate and stuff. And, you know, and, and she liked it. So from there on, after Sundance, after all the ceremonies are over, after the Okan is over, they have, they, they started having these dances. And, um, and they'd have little contests, you know, amongst each other. and everything, all the different societies, all the people in the camp. So with the with the, the Blackfoot and the Bloods, 
Speaking of the buds, this is where this first form of social dancing took place, like where the men really got involved. And with men, with the men who did the chicken dance. So, um, so that's, uh, that's the chicken dance, prairie chicken dance. Uh, so, but to continue on around powwow, go at a larger scale of powwow with the Blackfoot people. Um, I was told by a number of people, and the, the stories are a little bit different, but they're pretty much all the same. The most recent time I heard the story was uh, from from my from my grandfather, uh, spiritual grandfather, Alan Pard. He uh, he was telling me, and he specifically said it was the floods. The floods later, you know, this is you know we already had our chicken dance, but they went down into the uh, they went down. First of all, they went down into the crow people. They went to the crow people, and they. Uh, and on the behind the teepee was a tripod, and there was a, a bustle, or a crow, crow belt as they call it, was hanging on a tripod. And uh, this and this this particular crow uh, uh, band, or you know, they uh, they weren't very rich. There wasn't horses in the camp, and they see the one seen this this bustle hanging on a tripod. And he ran and he grabbed it says okay well we've got to go home with something there was no horses so they grabbed bundles and he grabbed this this uh this bustle this uh crow belt he grabs it and another one grabbed the drum and they took off with them they took off with them and stuff and um and they brought him back to the blood and the drum they knew what the drum was but this belt, they didn't know what it was. They didn't know how, how it was worn. They thought, you know, you wore it on the head, but that's not where you wore it. It didn't look right and stuff. So they hung on to them. They hung on to them. And uh, there's a certain period in, you know, on the plains in the, uh, I guess it would be in the summertime. There's a certain period where a lot of the, the different tribes on the plains, the Crow, the Arapaho, the Shawnee, the Pawnee, the Cheyenne, you know, the Grovons, the Blackfoot, Cree, where they can kind of travel freely. They travel and they, they visit, you know, one another and stuff. So at that time, the, 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 uh, the bloods, a few bloods went down into the crows and stuff and they inquired about these items and stuff and they told them, well, you know, these, uh, the, the drum comes from a, what they call uh, Geisbax and stuff. Some call it Sioux Society, some call it Grass Dance Society and stuff. But the society goes back to the Omaha people, the Omaha people. And so, uh, so they inquired and they said, well, this is a, a, it's a, you know, it's a grass dance society. It's a social society and it's meant for, for dancing, social dancing and stuff. So, and because they stole them, they, they stole these items, they went to the crow and they asked the crow, uh, well, can you transfer us the rights? You know, we have, you know, we have this victory over you, but now we want the rights to. So the crow agreed. And it's the crow who transferred the geist back to us. And, you know, that's as far as I, you know, and everybody I've talked to, it's the crow. And stuff, even though the name some say is Sioux Society or even more so Man Dance Society and stuff, because there's a there's a, a there's always an argument between how we call the Man Dance and how we call the, the Sioux, but we got it from the Crow. So they transferred this, they transferred the big drum. The big drum is the main the main thing of the, the society. It's, the, the, it's basically the leader has the has the big drum. He's, he's, well, there's two leaders. He's one of them, and then the one who wears the, uh, he wears the, the, the headdress, and it's the long headdress. It's a Sioux style headdress, but it has a long trailer on it and stuff. And today, uh, today Wayne Plum owns that headdress. 
And uh, anyways, there's, so when they transferred, they transferred a number of items and a number of dances with with uh, with the uh, with the Geisbach Society with the big drum. And some of these items range. Well, they have the big drum, and then you have the uh, the whips, the whips, and then you have the headdresses, Sioux style headdresses, and you have swords that go along with it. And you have daggers, and you have feather belts, crow belts, you have eagle belts. I own an eagle belt. I have got official rights and official transfers to an eagle belt. But, uh, you know, there, yeah, there's a number of items that go with this. And uh, then the grass dance, the grass dance came with them. So, uh, anyways, so it's, you know, for the most part, uh, like with the blood people, when they dance with that sun dance, and uh, and they would, and different families would, would gather, and they'd have little dances at their houses, but nothing really like official to call it like a powwow or Indian days and stuff. It was just family members and friends would get together and sing and dance, we do the chicken dance and all the women dances. But when the geisbacks came to our people, it it uh, it created a real structure around powwow because powwow has rules and has a certain structure so uh so it created a, a yeah it created a certain structure with the, the blood people and uh, you know like uh, uh i'll i'll stop there because i, I don't want to go too deep into that because i want to talk more about the dancing about about how the dancing came into this area Okay, well, first of all, like I said, we had the women dances, then we had the chicken dance, and then we had the grass dance. The grass dance. I'll talk about the grass dance. Okay, the grass dance. This one is a good one. This one is a good one, even to talk about how discourse takes place, you know, even our own people, how, how we misinterpret things or, or, or blatantly make up things. Mm -hmm. You know, to you know, just through our own interpretation, our biases, our you know, our being you know, ethnocentric, and you know, saying you know, we're the ones. But this is what I was told: is first of all, grass dance, a modern uh, interpretation of its origin. I, I will outright say is is wrong. The Cree people, they they take claim. On the grass dance, they they say that the grass dance came from you know their people when they moved camps and you know in the prairie grass they do this dance to knock down the grass so they can camp and stuff you know set up their teepees and uh, you know and the the fringes and I'll talk about the fringes I'll talk about the fringes in this dance anyways uh, they talk about the you know that the, the the yarn is like the waving grass and stuff and you know that's just silly. If you do your research and you really, really look into this dance and really do some extensive research, you know, you'll, you'll find what I'm saying is, is, is well documented and it told in a lot of the stories when you go back to the Geisbachs, that society, the Sioux Society, the Powell Society. But anyways, back in the days, the Omaha people, the Omaha, and they were, they were Plains people and a very, very powerful people very very warlike and stuff and they uh Omaha people well, they suffered quite a bit back in the days with the you know with the with contact and uh they suffered quite a bit they were involved in the civil wars they you know they're very warlike people and they uh created a what they call a scalp dance this is the original name for for, uh, for grass dance, as a scalp dance. And what they would do is, they would do this dance uh, before and after going to, to battle. And they would have, they would put their scalps in their belts. They would put their scalps in their belts and they would, they would dance. You know, uh, I guess expressing their victories. Expressing their victories through dance and stuff and uh, so this dance was you know it, that's what it was it was a scalp dance and 
and because of the times with the U.S. military and cavalry and, and everything, you know, um, it was, you know, uh, uh, it was transferred to, to other tribes. It made its way to the Sioux and it made its way, you know, slowly to the north, to, to the Blackfoot people through through the society and, uh, and into the Crees and, you know, all through, through North America. Because prior to, oh, I wanted to, well, let me just backtrack. Prior to the grass dance, most of the Northern Plains danced chicken. The Cree, the Arapaho, the Crow, they all danced chicken and stuff, but it's a Blackfoot dance. We, we, we transferred it off to them, this dance here and stuff, and that was primarily the dance and stuff. But then the grass dance came in and, uh, and it's, a, it's an old dance. It's a very old dance and stuff, but not as old as the chicken dance. But so anyways, the grass dance, it's a, like I said, it's a scalp dance and it made its way into the north. Or they say one of the first grass dancers in this area, to my knowledge, was a man by the name of Spider. And he was blood. He was blood and they, they say, uh, yeah, they say he was, uh, he was quite the womanizer. He became quite the womanizer because of the grass dance and stuff. He had, you know, a number of wives and had numerous children. And it was all because of his dancing, right? and, and it just, just, it's just what I heard him not. But, anyways, uh, so the grass dance, you know, some call, some, some call it the non-bustle dance. The non-bustle dance. It's very similar to chicken, and the the original dress is very similar to chicken. You know, the the way the, the way they dress, and. Uh, but with this dance, um, well, it became very popular, and you know, and it still is today. But there was a, you know, in the, I guess it would be in the early seventies, in the early seventies. Like nowadays, they they have yarn on their outfits, on their, you know, along their knees. And yarn, you know, fringes and stuff, like I was saying, they, you know, they, now they interpret it as flowing grass, but that's not what it was, I'll tell you where the, the yarn came from. There was a man by the name of Kenny Scabby Rope, he's from Browning, he's from Browning, a big name person, he's a big in powwow today, he has a drum group and with all his sons called Black Lodge, they're world renowned singers, they've traveled the world, and they, you know, they won Grammys and stuff, you know. They're well-known people, you know, they're very well-known singers and powwow -well people. Well, Kenny Scabby wrote, in his days, you know, they, they called him, you know, the, the Godfather. That was his, he was dubbed the nickname of the Godfather. He was like, like he walk on water when he dances and stuff. Anyways, there was a powwow down in White Swan, Washington. And... <coughs> was a powwow down there and um, somehow his outfit had caught on fire in the suitcase I'm not exactly sure the details but they shut it out and a lot of his stuff was ruined he had some beadwork and he, they didn't know what to do and he wanted to dance you know in the contest to make some money so he turned around and uh, they went to the store, there was a little convenience store, they went there and they were trying to find stuff to make up an outfit. So they looked and there was a, a bunch of mops, a bunch of mops and they grabbed a whole bunch of mops and stuff and they took them home and they cut the, cut the fringe, they cut the, you know, the strings off the mops and everything and they tied it into his leggings and tied it into his, his armbands and stuff, his fringes and stuff. And he went out there, and that's how he went out and danced. That's the first time you see the fringes. And it was mom dancing. This is what happened. And it just caught on. You know, next weekend, other people were dressed the same way, and pretty soon it got into, into you know, the long fringes and stuff. But the original, they were just basic armbands, basic beaded armbands, cuffs, late bands, bridge claws, and stuff. And, uh, so that's, you know, part of the grass dance. 
but it's that's where it comes from. It's an Omaha dance, Omaha yeah, scalp dance. And there was another dance that the Omaha had brought up. This one was uh, they call it the horse dance, and they they wear a horse tail on the back, and they still same thing. That they all dressed very similar, with cuffs, and you know just very very basic. And uh, but they wear horse tail. It's called a horse dance. This dance has died on this. It's no, but it was a social dance, and it, it made its way up here. The black some some black foot uh, people did the horse dance. It was a social dance, and. Uh, and their their dance. This is where what we call the some call it the crow hop, call it the crow hop, and others call it Pawnee horse horse stealing dance and stuff. But it's it, it comes from Omaha. It's, but it's basically a crow hop and stuff is the, the beat of it. But it, it died out. That's the only thing that's left of this dance is, is the crow hop. And then. Uh, Okay, uh, now we will get into uh, the war dance. The war dance is a Sioux dance. And this dance here, they, uh, they wear the headdress. Now, today they call it, you know, um, yeah, you know, men's headdress. And stuff, or men's buckskin and stuff. And, Nowadays, this dance is made primarily elders. Elders do this dance, but in the old days, back in the, you know, it was young warriors. It was the young young warriors who you know who 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 received the headdresses through their deeds and stuff. You know, men as young as twenty into their to their mid thirties, they're the ones who had the headdress because they go into battle with their headdresses and stuff, and you know, and they tell victories and they do this war dance. They do a war dance, and you know, and you know, and it's a, uh, you know, nowadays it's it's a very simple, graceful dance. But in in the old days, uh, you know, nowadays when they dance, they you know, it's, they they it's just a basic one two, and it's very graceful, and they stand straight up. But in the old days, they used to move around quite a bit. They would crouch and they would move around and stuff, and they always had their their fans, some would even have a shield, some would have shields tied to them and these are, well these are, there's ceremony reasons why they have their shields, but they'd have their shields and they'd have a acoustic or they would have a spear and stuff because, you know, a lot of the ones who wore the headdresses, they were the ones who counted coup, and that's why they, you know, they had great victories counting coup on an out enemy, that's the way they got their, their headdresses and stuff, whether it's with the acoustic or touch their enemy with the acoustic or with their hand or, or they touch them with their spear just letting their enemy know that I could have killed you. And they would, you know, so, and then they would retell their uh, victories in, in their dance. And uh, so this is uh, where buckskin comes from. It's a war dance. And uh, and with the guy spags, going back, this, 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 this is how the headdress came to the uh, the, the Sioux style came to, to the Bud people. Um, we had our own style of headdress, though, you know, and, but this was more ceremonial. They're straight up headdress, they're in a cylinder shape, whereas uh, the Sioux style is more spread out and stuff. And, and uh, yeah, they're, they're totally different. And uh, even with that, with the headdress, uh, you know, the headdress. You have to go through a certain transfer to, to get the headdress. And usually, you don't go out and seek a headdress. It's your family members through, through your accomplishments. They're the ones who will get a headdress for you. And they'll say, well, we're going to get a headdress for you. You know, it's their way of saying, you know, you're, you become a chief and stuff. And speaking of the headdress, the Blackfoot people, even though this uh, headdress originated from the Sioux, the Blackfoot people are the only ones who still know how to do the transfer. The Sioux people, you know, where the headdress originated from, they don't even know how to do the transfer anymore. The Blackfoot, when there's certain uh, uh, things that have to go with it, certain songs, there's a capturing, and this all goes back to the Geist 
there's a capturing song, there's a, a you know, a, it's, a, it's quite a, quite a, uh, quite a ceremony. There's, you know, five different songs, there's payments and everything and stuff, but it gives you a right to be the chief and stuff. But anyways, this is where the buckskin dance comes from. This is the, or, or, the origin of it. Like I said, but in the old days it was young men, nowadays it's old men. Um, okay, that's the buckskin. And then, um, the fancy dance. The fancy dance. Um, this dance here originates from the o o Oklahoma people, the Oklahoma tribe, and Oklahoma and Pawnee. See, originally, and we're going back, this, this dance was probably created, estimated, in the mid 1800s, in the mid 1800s, and stuff, you know, around a lot of the signing of the American treaties, mid early 1800s. There's a, there's a, a they call well, they come from Oklahoma State. They call it they in the states there they there's a term the the, the Trail of Tears. Oklahoma is considered the Indian state. A lot of northern tribes, Pawnee, Arapaho, uh, Kiowa, Oklahoma, Cheyenne, these are all central and northern Plains tribes. And when they signed the treaties, they, they set up their, a lot of the reservations down in Oklahoma. And they, they made the natives travel to Oklahoma and stuff and a lot of a lot of the, the Indian people from these different tribes that had made had had died on this on this trail. They call it Trail of Tears. They had died. They starved and and going into extreme heat. You know, being in the north into some of the extreme heat they died. But they were all put into you know into the state of Oklahoma. And the thing was is they were all enemies. They were all enemies, you know, you know um, so Going back to the Pawnee and the uh, uh, Oklahoma and the Kiowa, they were all on one same reservation. They, they amalgamated them and stuff. And in order to keep peace amongst one another, they decided to do it in endurance. And so they would they would do this dance and sing and sing and sing and sing and song after song and at a very, very fast beat song after song after song and they would dance and dance until the last man was standing you know and, and everything and you know and they would have to you know show their endurance and you know and if you slowed down you'd get tapped tapped on the shoulder to you know to get off the get off the dance floor and stuff and and, uh, and this dance here they uh they would wear two bustles, two round bustles, perfectly round, or they would wear one big round bustle and stuff. And they were huge, huge bustles. And they would wear, you know, uh, uh, huge brass bells and stuff. Because on the other hand, there's the, the endurance, but it's also showing that you can pack a little bit more with the brass bells. And we're not just, we're talking, you know, maybe 20 pounds, 30 pounds of brass bells around your ankles. You know and stuff and even around your wrists and stuff and you know continue to do the stance you know and, you know to to show how uh, yeah your endurance and this stance here it it mainly stayed in that area uh, yeah it stayed in that area for a number of years it wasn't until the the mid 1900s when it started to make its way north and the first time the black people seen it was in the early 60s i believe I believe it was in 1961 in a place called Star School in Browning in uh, the Blackfeet Reservation in Montana, just uh, just north of Browning. There's a community called Star School. They uh, had an old hall there, old hall where they would have powwows. They would have powwows, and. Uh, there was a, a guy by the name of Boy Lad, and he's Omaha, and 
and I forget, I can't remember his partner's name, but they had come to the north, they come to Star School. They had come to Star School and to the they had a little powwow, little little function going on there and they had traveled for they came to Star School and they had uh said, well, we got this dance. We want to show you guys this dance and stuff. Because they were, they were dancing both grass and, and chicken and, you know, doing the other dances, common dances. And uh, they said, well, we got to want to show you guys this dance, do an exhibition. And they said, okay, well, you know, so the guy doing the MC said, well, we got these, these people from the south, you know, they want to share their dance and everything. And so there was, you know, people from the Bloods and Six of Guy, you know, all of if you, you know, from Bikani and Scappy Bikani, they were all there in the, in, in Brown and well in Star School at the hall. And so these two young guys come out and they had both had two bustles and everything and they're, you know, on their backs and everything. And, and they started to do this dance, and this fancy dance, and uh, showing the Blackfoot people this new dance. And this dance is, you know, it's quite intense, you know, there's lots of kicking and jumping and, you know, crouching and, you know, hands on the ground and, you know, cartwheels and, you know, somersaults and stuff. And it was, you know, it was quite different from the chicken dance and the grass dance and stuff. And so they did it, they did a song for them. And when they got done the song, the, the hall was completely quiet, completely, completely quiet. And uh, and then all of a sudden, everybody started laughing, busting a gut. All the Blackfoots thought it was so hilarious. They, you know, so hilarious and stuff. They, you know, they, because they never seen anything like it. And they, you know, like they, you know, they, yeah, they thought it was, you know, really, really funny. They, you know, thought these two young guys were half nuts and stuff with their dance and you know and that's the way they described it at least that's the way I heard it eh? and I heard the story from old, uh, Earl old person he told me about this at one point and he said because he was there eh? he was there and he said they laughed and laughed and he said but then a few years after he started to see a few more people from the south with his dance and then pretty soon there was people in Browning they say one of the first ones down there in Browning one of the first if not the first Blackfoot to dance fancy. And he was from he was from the Bloods here, but he was married in Browning. His name was Stanley Whiteman. Stanley Whiteman and stuff. And he's got a couple he's got a couple boys, uh, Luke and Ferlin Whiteman, Stan Jr. and stuff. And they're they're really good fancy. Even today they're well into their fifties and they still compete against eighteen year olds and beat them and stuff. So Stanley Whiteman, the, their father, he he was, if not the first Blackfoot to dance fancy, and then it then it just took its way. Like my my father danced fancy, a lot of my my family members dance fancy and stuff. So, anyways, this is where fancy dance came into this area, and uh, and it's quite popular today. Like my son dances fancy, and he's 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 quite a good dancer. Like he competes and he. He's got quite a few victories in the dance. Okay, um... Okay, we've got that. Okay, now, talk about men's traditional. Men's traditional. There's two different styles of it. There's two different styles. There's a, some would call, today some would call a northern and a southern. Northern and a southern. Well, in reality, what they call the southern traditional is actually the northern. It's a northern style. Um, if you go back to the Omaha, not to the Omaha, the Kiowa, the Oklahoma people, all the different tribes in Oklahoma State, the Pawnee, they have a certain dress, uh, certain dress, and uh, a certain style of dance. Well, like I said, they were northern tribes. They were northern tribes, but prior to that, 
there was like we, we I talked about the war dance, about the war dance, and it, you know, and it's, and it's the buckskin outfits with the buckskin leggings and stuff. Well, uh, this dance here, the traditional dance, it's also it's it's also comes out of the the, the geist backs. and uh, what it is is a. Uh, They're also, it's, uh, the Sioux people have what they call a buffalo dance. And this dance is, well, this is the, the last form of it, this is traditional dance. Um, and they, when they dance, they stay low, they stay low, like they're sneaking into a, into a camp or, you know, uh, sneaking up to enemy and stuff. You know, there's even a dance called the sneak up dance. And, uh, it's a, it, but it's originally a buffalo dance, and as time went on, as time went on, they, they in the in the old days they used to wear buffalo headdresses, and they'd have a buffalo tail, or they would wear different type of feather belts. But as time went on, the buffalo were no longer here and stuff. So the headdress was later replaced with a roach, uh, which is made of out of porcupine hair, and. Uh, but this dance here, um, like it was well adapted, well adapted to, uh, you know, across the plains. But it's basically, it's another war dance, but it, that's where it originates from, as the buffalo dance. And, uh, yeah, and then it's also expressing, also expressing, you know, victories and stuff. What we got sprinkling <laughs> going. I know. Are they coming this way? What are they doing? Pretty crazy. <laughs> <laughs> think I think it's going to sprinkle us, isn't it? I think so. We'll move over. Yeah, we'll move. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, so a traditional dance, it's, it's basically a buffalo dance. That's where it comes from. That's what I was told. It, uh, it's a part of the Geisbach and stuff. And the Geisbach, like, I'm just speaking of the bloods, and, you know, speaking of the bloods and how, how Powell came into this area. Okay, um, okay, these are, all of these dances I talked about, they're man dances. The women dances, they always had, and a lot of the Plains tribes had women, they all ad adopted the women dances. And those, like I said, were some of the first social dances and the recording dances. And uh, so, back in the days, back in the days with the Bloods, uh, the women slowly started to develop what they call women's traditional and stuff. And mainly, that dance was created by, uh, well, the men with the, the headdresses, you know, the men's buckskin their wives would dance beside them and stuff and so that's kind of where the women's traditional came in and it's just a graceful one two very graceful dance you know supporting their husbands and stuff and you know it's, there's not too much to be said about it you know it's a graceful dance and that's where it came from them you know women supporting their husbands while they're you know expressing their victories and you know wearing their headdresses and uh but later Later in the years, and this goes back to the 60s and stuff, um, there was a lot of young women that wanted to do men dance. They wanted to dance, see? Eh? And, you know, they kind of hop around like, you know, like men and stuff. And, but, and, uh, but it wasn't looked too highly upon because, you know, because of uh, social standards and, you know, and the, you know women's... Uh, uh, you know, the way women are supposed to, you know, be in the community and, you know, and stuff. And so, my, you know, speaking about my aunt, my aunt, her name is Barbara Scout. When she was young, when she was young, she wanted to dance. And so she turned around and she dressed up like a man, a chicken dancer. And she went out there and she danced chicken wasn't looked too highly upon, but she did it anyways. She did it anyways, and and uh, she used to she used to beat the men. She used to beat.
beat the men at dancing and stuff. And, and then, you know, she was like one of the first, if not the first, to do, to do this, to dress as a man and dance. And this still continues, like my daughter, her name is Latasha, she's a chicken dancer and stuff. And she's a chicken dancer and she beats the other guys. She's actually quite, quite good at it. So this is when women really started getting into the dance and stuff. And uh, so they would dance chicken. They would dance along the men. They would dance along the men. It wasn't up until there was a woman by the name of Gladys Jefferson. She was from, she's from the Crow. She's from the Crow people. Uh, back in her area, same thing was happening. Same thing was happening. They would dress as uh, they, and the, her it was fancy. She she dressed like a man and dance fancy and stuff. And she was beating them, beating them. And and down there they they didn't like this, so they kind of uh, you know they forbid it for women to dance, you know, amongst the men and stuff. And they forbid them to to wear men's regalia and stuff. So she in turn went out in a dress and started dancing like a man, but in a dress and stuff, and, and it really caught on. It really caught on, and they say, you know, in that area, she's one of the first, you know, female fancy dancers, and she made her way up this way into into the, the, the Blackwood area, and my Auntie Barbara had seen her, and, you know, my Auntie Barbara was still dancing with chicken, and had seen, seen Gladys Jefferson, and so the next Paolo, uh, my auntie Barb was back in a dress dancing fancy oh. and stuff and then it, it you know that's where it came from fancy dance is basically uh, women's fancy is basically women started out dressing like men and then went back to the dress because they were forbidden to dress like men and stuff so that's where that was created and then the shawls came into place but before it was just a straight buckskin dress and stuff and some would have a couple sticks but that was basically a, and that's the way that, you know this dance was created. Some say nowadays it was came from a butterfly, but that's just that's just uh, crazy. It's not where it came and stuff. And then uh, and then we'll get into uh, okay. I talked about the traditional. I talked about the fancy dance. The uh, <coughs> the other woman's dance is uh, what they call the jingle dance. This dance here is a fairly new dance. All the dance I've, dances I've spoke spoken about have, you know, uh, you know, were created, you know, you know, uh, prior to the 1800s or 1800s and, and prior to that, going back to the dog days and stuff, are you know, are were uh, you know, are evolved from these dances. But the the jingle dance, it it came, it, it came in the 1900s in the mid 1950s and stuff. There was a woman uh, down in Ontario area, Ojibwe, Ojibwe woman. Her name was Maggie White. And they were in a little village in, in northern Ontario and stuff, little community, little Ojibwe community. And there was a sickness going around and stuff. And people were dying. I'm not exactly sure what sickness. And so, and I heard this story from Maggie herself. She had come into uh, Rufus Good Striker used to have a camp out by uh, Chief Mountain there, out in out in the our forest reserve there. And uh, he used to have by the Belly River, and he had a powwow there. And they invited this Maggie to to come show her dance. And uh, anyways, Maggie told a story. Her her village there, they were. They were sick, and uh, and they were dying, and apparently a rattlesnake had come to her in her dream and told her, you know, showed her a dance and said, you have to do this dance, you have to do this dance, you have to create this uh, this dress, this particular dress, and you know, and it had cones on it. Some say they were uh, tin cones. Some say that. Uh, uh, they were uh, deer hooves, but Maggie herself, she said they were they were uh, uh, shells, bullet shells, 
and stuff. And that's that's what she had said in the story. And so, you know, that there were bullet shells and they fastened them to the dress. And apparently you were supposed to have 365 of these three shells on the dress. You know, so you know, so the people that are sick will at very least reach, you know, she'll perform this dance to the sick, you know, people are sick. And after she performs this dance, she'll at least guarantee them three hundred, one more year of life, or more, mm. and stuff. And, uh, and it was a snake that gave it to you. <laughs> it was a snake that gave her this dance. That one's getting bigger. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it was a snake that gave her this dance in a dream. And the snake told her to move, like the way a snake moves, the way a snake moves. And when they do the downbeat to stop in one place, and when the stop's in one place and everything, they, they raise their hand, they raise their hand, and this represents the snake standing up, standing up. And when they come back down, they're supposed to bring their hand down fast. And this is supposed to be the snake striking. And, the, and with this, the snake strikes the sickness away and stuff. And it's, it started out as a ceremonial dance. And, it, and there's a, quite a number who only do it in ceremony. But it, it, it made its way to the powwow and stuff. And, you know, and I heard this story from Maggie. And she came out to the, to the, uh, to Rufus's, uh, camp and she told the story and they showed this dance and at that time um, Nadine I believe she goes by tail feathers but that's uh, uh, Wilton's daughter Wilton Goodstriker's daughter she was uh, Maggie had transferred a uh, jingle dress to her and stuff so in, so in this area when it came I would say that uh, Nadine is the first one to do jingle um, you know official rights and it was officially transferred the Dean Good Striker was the first one to do jingle in this area and stuff and then it just caught on and this was back in 1982 and stuff and you never seen jingle dance it wasn't until the mid oh, I would say about 87 to 89 is when you really started to see the jingle there was no contest for it but now it's very very popular dance okay so um, so going back to that so those are the basic origins and the, the way the, the dances came to uh, to the Blackfoot people. Um, okay, so that's just how it came to the people and with the origin. But the powwow itself, the powwow itself, to to what we know as today. Um, after a lot of the treaty signing in the states, in, in the states, and in in, uh, in Canada, we're talking the the later part of the 1800s. <coughs> a lot of natives were put on reserves. You know, the buffalo were gone, and you know, and then there was a whole. Uh, you know, things were you know really getting settled on on the on the prairies, on the plains, out west, and stuff, and you know. Uh, we had already gotten through, you know, a lot of the major Indian battles, and you know, uh, the native people, you know, were forced to res reservations, reserves, forced to farming, and all of that. There's a whole lifestyle change and stuff, and uh, and there was a lot of uh, they. I guess I would credit the powwow today to uh, Buffalo Bill. After the buffalo were gone, he, you know, and he's, he's accredited to a lot of this uh, Wild West image, which, you know, is partly true, but partly not, and stuff, this whole Wild West image and stuff. Buffalo Bill, he, what he had done is he had, he had a Wild West show, and, you know, they had rodeos, and they had, you know, you know, gunfights, and they were portraying how, you know, I guess in his, his eyes, of how the West was. Mm -hmm. And they would perform in cities and fairs and whatnot, and, you know, gather the people, and they, you know, do different demonstrations and different skits. 
And, you know, of course, in the West, you have to have the Indians. And so they bring in the Indians. And, and a lot of these, uh, you know, like, you know, like different, like, uh, say, like Sitting Bull. Sitting Bull was part of Wild West show. A lot of the, the Sioux people, Cheyenne people, they took part in this. And, you know, and particularly, you know, those two tribes, because they were involved in, you know, the Battle of Little Bighorn and stuff, so they were well known for their part in the Battle of Little Bighorn. So while, uh, while uh, Buffalo Bill, he, uh, he hired them up and he traveled with them. And they would, you know, they would perform and they would do, you know, um, little skits about their battles and perform all the dances and everything. They would move from town to town, different stampede, different fairs that took place and everything. And, and, uh, and this kind of just caught on. This kind of caught on through, through you know, you know, so different cities would, would host, you know, uh, they'd have their fairs, you know, even up here, up here in Canada, you know, we have the Calgary Stampede, but prior to the Calgary Stampede, you'd have Fort McLeod Stampede, you have Tabor Stampede, you have, you know, Claris Home Stampede, and they'd call on the Blackfoot, you know, to go perform dances and stuff. And uh, so, you know, this, this was going on. They travel, you know, a lot of natives would, would travel, Great Glacier Park, you know, my family took part, you know, in this quite a bit. Like, I come from a long, long uh, history of Powell people. And, uh, so, this would occur. This would occur, and, uh, and, uh, they say the first real celebration, the first celebration, uh, where it was Indian run, was it, it wasn't had nothing to do with uh, with a you know local non-native community uh, carnival or you know fair or anything like that. Was Crow Crow Fair? They say that's the oldest oldest celebration, like where it was Indian run, and and it, the Crow. This was in the late 1800s. They had I if I'm not let's see. This would be approximately 130 years ago, if I remember correctly. No, it would be 132 years ago, because the last time I was in Crow was seven years ago, and they were celebrating their 100 and 125th, so. So, uh, yeah, so 132 years ago, they're, they're, this was the very first, I guess you would call it, official Pawa. They, uh, and they invited a lot of neighboring tribes to, to come, and one of it was, see, the Crow were, very shunned because the crow in, in the states in the early days when you know when they were settling the west and there was all the Indian battles and the, you know, the cavalry the crow you know they were scouts for, for for the cavalry and they're responsible for a lot of killing of, of native people also and they were looked you know they were looked down on because of that and you know so in turn they invited a lot of different tribes and whatnot, and, you know, I guess in one way, you know, to, to uh, pay homage of, of their roles and stuff and everything, and the Crow are, even today, like Crow Fair is going to be on this coming weekend, they're well known for their giveaways, and they have huge, huge giveaways and stuff, they'll give away horses, like cars, everything, huge, huge giveaways, and it's to all the visitors and stuff, and that's what it was meant for, to give back, to give back for what they had done wrong, and stuff, so Crow Fair was the first real official powwow, and all the other tribes started having, hosting powwows, and stuff, and they'd have contests, you know, they'd, you know, they'd have contests, you know, for the different tribes, and, you know, coming in, and stuff, and it's, and, and when, you know, and, in doing the contests, and then other tribes coming in, it kept alive that, that uh, uh, I guess, that, uh, manta that warlike mentality amongst the Plains. Because most Plains, most Plains Indians were very warlike. Warlike people with lots of battles and lots of counting coup and victories and stuff. And so it transformed into that where, like if I go into, into, uh, 
to the crows or the Sioux or the Cree and stuff, when I'm coming home, it's like it's like a scalp. If I win, you know, if I win first place, second place, and I come home with money, it's like a scalp. It's a victory, you know. And I can name, give names on those victories. I can do a lot of things with those victories. But uh, but with the Blackfoot people, our the very first celebration here was about 25 years after Crow, and that was in the Gundy, that was in Brocken. But the Blackfoot people, that's the oldest celebration. Uh, the, the, they were the first ones to host a uh, major power and stuff, and they still continue today and stuff. And uh, So that's basically on, you know, on the one end is how Powell came into this area. And uh, I guess I'll leave it at that for now. Mm -hmm. So I'll stop here and I'll think of thinking of anything else. Okay, I just want to talk a little bit about, uh, talk, have a little discussion about Kainai Indian Days and how it came, how it came to be. I, I, I'm not exactly sure the how long our Indian Days has been around, but it's been around for quite a few years, number of years, and stuff. And uh, see, around a block with people, you know, particularly the bloods. Like I had mentioned before, Brockett was the first real Indian days and stuff. They had they hosted Indian days because they didn't really have, you know, they had lost a lot of their spiritual stuff. You know, they didn't, didn't have a, like a foreign society per se. They had what they uh, called the uh, Sinopa, Kid Fox Society, what's pretty similar to the horns. They had a lot of our, our you know, societies, uh, you know, cannot tune the decks and, you know, some of the, but, uh, you know, but they, their Sundance stopped and, you know, this was their way, you know, of, of celebrating and getting people together with their Indian Days. Brown and also started a, their Indian Days and, a, and it's been around for about a hundred years or so. And so Browning and the North American Indian, uh, North American Indian Days, and it was a huge, huge celebration and very similar to they no, no longer had Sundance. Their societies were cleaning and everything, whereas the Blood Reserve, the Blood Reserve and N6 Sakai, N6 Sakai, we were still, you know, well intact, well intact, and, you know, and like, our, our, like I had mentioned about the chicken dance, and when all of these other dances were introduced into our area, after Sundance, we'd, we'd celebrate, we'd have Indian days, we'd have a big powwow. And stuff, and there, and there was a number, of, you know, a number of people who come out and dance. A number of neighbors tried to come, you know, particularly for the powwow afterwards. And but prior, you know, in and around this time, <coughs> there was a, <coughs> a lot of social societies that were created because a lot of people, particularly the Bloods, our 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 whole community structure is built on social societies. And like we have like what we call the Magpie Society, there's a Sissixis, there's a Headdress Society, there's a Youthman Society, Old Agent Society, they're, you know, and they're, they're usually, you know, a group of men that are around the, around the same age or a group of friends and stuff and they get together and they do things in the community. So, you know, and this was back in, you know, was, you know, I would say in the 60s and stuff. In the 60s, they would, you know, even prior to that, a group of men, they just do good deeds in the community. They'd hunt together, you know, they, they you know, but they'd all, every year they would host a, a, a function, a powwow, and a feast and, and everything, you know, to give back to the community and to show the community that they're, they're, uh, you know, their, their, their worth in the community and stuff, you know, and they would, you know, they would host, you know, even, you know, modern things, basketball tournaments, uh, baseball tournaments, hockey tournaments, you know, all different types of function, uh, track and field, you know, and stuff, and it was for, for the community, there was some purely social society and stuff, and, uh, you know, even 
to the point, you know, like say the Gladstone Hall. Gladstone Hall. Well, before the Gladstone Hall was there, this was the sixties. Uh, my my great uncle, his name is Tony Wolfchild, He's passed on. He was uh, he was he was one of the founders of this the society, sixties. And what he did, what they they did, their their group there, and they usually range from about twenty five men around in and around there, maybe thirty, and and their wives and stuff. And what they did is they actually went out to the mountains and cut and cut timber and built a hall and it was known as Sixty Hall and stuff and they would have they would host their celebration there they'd have a powwow there and stuff but this was all the way from Sundance and this was usually you know throughout the year not not around Sundance but there weren't really official powwows it was just mainly you know within the communities mainly um, but still the big celebration was after the Sundance and um, so there was a period of time when the when the, the horns didn't transfer and it was like 26 years uh, 26 years and then Adam Delaney came in and he brought his group in and stuff my grandfather Ed Caffer was part of this group part of Alan, uh, Adam Delaney's group mm. he brought in their group and and at this time, there was a lot of things around, you know, you know, reformity, trying to get things the way they should be, because, you know, unfortunately at that time there was a lot of alcoholism. You know, in this in this time, you know, during this time is when uh, Native people were given citizenship, and we were able to go to liquor stores and bars and whatnot and, you know so unfortunately that you know that that uh you know, being able to go to liquor stores and create a lot more alcohol in the community and there was a lot of drinking uh, at the summit during the power and you know and those things are just not supposed to be there for the rest of it. And I guess at one point you know, they had decided, well, we'll do the powwow, we'll, we'll separate it, we'll separate it, you know, so we don't have this large drinking, because there was a lot of bad things that took place, you know, with alcohol and in the encampment, and, you know, and all the things that come with, with alcohol abuse. So, so this was decided, so they, they uh, decided to have the, to separate it, and then this is where kind of Indian days was created, and, and with that, with that, uh, they they put it out there where where they would, uh, you know, the different social societies would put in a proposal to host this powwow. They went back to the social societies rather than going with the horns or going with the, the spiritual societies, you know, and stuff, you know, because the social societies were doing that anyway, so they would ho host the kind of Indian days. And stuff, and I believe the very first society to host was uh, no, I don't believe I, I know this. It was uh, Magpie Society. They host the first kind of Indian days and stuff, and and uh, so that's where kind of Indian days was was created, and uh, and you know it still goes on today, but uh, like I said, that's where there was a separation, and you know, and it's it's kind of funny because you know uh, it's funny the way they set it up because on one hand I would you know if you know just talking about the, the reforming part it's funny because uh, like now it's the, the celebration is first rather than after some dance and stuff or is uh, the original like going back to the to the where prairie chicken dance comes from you know it, it's supposed to be at the end oh. and stuff but they still do you know do it at the end there's still little dances that occur from time to time not every year but from time to time they'll have they'll have little powwow and little contests and stuff and you know I don't, they don't necessarily dress up as more the society members and the different you know, 
societies that compete against one another and, and everything. And, but yeah, that's kind of where Tiny Indies 